session, we, um, you know, we talk a lot about grief families and we often think mostly of parents, but there's another really important part of families and that's siblings. And so wanted to share a video of one grief sibling with you today. Hi, my name is Abby Gil Clariaki, and I want to share with you my journal. Um, and my brother has a GRIA 2 condition, aka Jack condition. And I want to tell you about it. If I have one wish, I would spend it on my brother. So I love my brother and I want him to have a better future. I wouldn't spend it on me. I wouldn't spend it on anything, but that's anything else, but that's my choice. PM wake up time. My brother had seizures today. We found out about his genetic grade 2 condition when he was one and a half years old. He had a thing where his he threw his head back and rolled his eyes back too. That scared me and my parents. Then one day he did that for a long time. Then we had to take him to the hospital. We found out that he had a brain bleed in the center of his brain. He was still seizuring, and with all his medication they gave him, they had to intubate him. After intubating him, he coded. A ton of people came to help him. It, they were able to get his vitals working again, but his brain was still in the trouble. It took 14 days in the PICU, then Cole came home with epilepsy medication to help him. Then months later, it happened again. He had a seizure that would not stop. This time, we were told that he had infantile spasms. See, are the only seizure that caused brain damage. Then we finally got him home. This time, we had to give him shots and more medication. After a while, they told us he ha did not have infantile spasms anymore, but they could come back. Today, he still has seizures, but they are shorter. And finally, they told us he has a genetic condition, grade two, and caused all this and more. And it is really rare. He is really strong, and we all love him so much, so much. He is working on sounds, and he has a gait trainer. He is so cute, and he collects when he wants food or more of something. Okay, um, so now we're gonna start with our first keynote, really excited about this. And um, Dr. Paduri will, will tell a little more, but before we start, I just wanna mention in terms of asking questions, because we have a uh, virtual audience and an audience in the room, um, please make sure if you're in the room and wanna ask questions that you use a mic, otherwise people can't hear you um, vir who are attending virtually. And also there are, uh, for people virtually, um, there is, uh, you can ask questions through the app or uh, the website, however you're watching. People in the room, if you have the app, which I strongly recommend, questions uh, that way as well. And we'll be going back and forth between um, questions from in the room and questions through the app uh, when it's time. And it'll work that way throughout the conference. Um, so I think to ask a question, I think it's the communications tab on the left side of uh, the app or, or web page. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, so over to Dr. Paduri for what I think is gonna be an amazing session. Thanks. 
Keith. So I'm really, really honored to be able to introduce these brave individuals who are sitting up on the stage. Um, so I want to thank you at the beginning, and we'll thank you at the end, but really, really appreciate your willingness to come and share your experiences with the community in the room, but also in the, the community online. Um, I've been asked to introduce you, so I'll do that briefly, um, and certainly would then welcome your thoughts on, on a number of different topics. We have some questions we discussed ahead of time, but also um, if there's other things that you'd like to add, please go ahead and do that, and I'll, I'll try to call on you and give everybody a chance to speak. So I'll start in the order that I have. We have um, Milan Atanasov and his mom, Itzita. Um, chance to meet them earlier this morning. That's you. <laughs> Milan is 15. He has a variant in the GRIN1 gene. Uh, that's a loss of function variant. And at school, he's in the 10th grade, um, loves to play video games and would like to become an alchemist. Uh, we have Jordan Dunn. Jordan's 24 years old and has a GRIN 2D variant, um, as, as well as another unrelated gene variant. She was diagnosed last June. Um, it took 23 years and five attempts with genetics to receive a diagnosis. She's lived in three different states, Ohio, Utah, and Indiana, recently back in Ohio. Um, and she's had brain surgery at the age of 10. Um, she's, had, uh, she's a very talented artist. Um, you might see one of her pieces on the auction, although um, You'll have to outbid me <laughs> if you want to. Um, she enjoys uh, music, video games, looking for rocks and shells at the beach, riding roller coasters, and watching movies and TV shows. We have Matt Smith. Matt's 43 and is impacted by the GRIA2 gene. Um, as an infant, Matt exhibited symptoms that were thought to maybe be seizures um, and had some stimming behaviors, but EEG did not show seizures. Um, and Matt's here hoping to gain more information about uh, his daughter who has the same variant as well. And finally, we have Benjamin Vaughn at the end. Um, he started having seizures at three years of age in 2004. 10 years later, is one of the first few patients discovered to have a variant in the GRIN 2A gene. And today at age 21, he's over seven years seizure free, which is amazing. Um, and I'll just say before getting into some of the questions, how impressed I am by all of your willingness to share this very, very personal information with us, with the community, really to educate everybody and to be able to help us learn uh, from each other, but mostly to learn from you. So thank you for that. Sorry, I forgot to take the mask off, but I hope you heard all of that. Um, so we have some general questions and I thought we'll start just by going down um, in order, you have a mic and we've got another mic here we can pass down. Um, this is gonna be a little bit different because we've got folks at different ends of the, the age spectrum. Um, but I, I'll start just by asking, you know, how were you, um, how were you impacted by the diagnosis of a GRI disorder? Would you like to start? Sure. <clears throat> okay. Well, first of all, you know, I'd like to say, you know, thank you for all of you who've chosen to be here for this. So provide support and learn more. But when we learned about this, this was it, it was quite a shock, you know, that we knew that you know, there would be challenges with uh, raising a child who is not what would be considered and who would be considered neurotypical. But fortunately, um, my wife and I, we happen to be living, we live in Baltimore and with between Johns Hopkins, the Kennedy Krieger Institute, we're surrounded by a great number of organizations that are able to provide support and reach out. And you know, my wife in particular has uh, made this like her mission to reach out to people to, who have family and loved ones affected by these conditions to share information and link them up with resources such as Cure Grin and others you know, who to provide treatments and support. And I'm glad to be right along with her. And I can say that while it has been filled with uncertainty and you know, our daughter has been making tremendous progress within the last couple of months, you know, through a variety of treatments. And so, you know, we're, we're, the outlook is, is positive. It will be, it will take time, but I'm convinced that, uh, you know, there will, she'll be able to uh, gain a decent level of functioning, you know, and over, over the next several years and we just forge ahead as best we can day to day. So. Milan and Ipsita. So um, in the beginning, when we didn't know what was wrong with him, we looked everywhere, we were just looking for a diagnosis. 
So, and I think 2014, we, he got diagnosed and then we had a sense of relief that, okay, we know what it is, but we didn't know what to do after that. So that was very scary, but we found, uh, I found Keith on Facebook and then I realized, oh, there's another whole world out there with parents and kids who have, so we are not alone. So that was a big relief. And after that, um, all these uh, research, researchers, doctors came along and then we saw that, okay, there is hope. So now I feel, because in the beginning people told us, the doctors told us, that, okay, he won't develop anymore. He won't grow anymore. So they like, accept it and it was uh, so, but we refused to give up. So we kept on pushing, kept on pushing and he's growing. I mean, slowly, slower than a neurotypical child perhaps, but I, that's not a problem for us. We just want him to grow. He, he is happy kid and it's growing good. You can pass the mic down, yes. Jordan. Uh, oh, your mic. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, you repeat the question. <laughs> sure. I, it's a general question. How have you been affected by a, a grey disorder? Um, I've been affected by it. Um, Sorry, let me take a minute. Um, I've been affected by it in ways that I struggle to make friends and do math. And I also struggle with um, ADHD, which is also incorporated in the grim disorder. And I also struggle with things like OCD as well. Thank you. Benjamin? Well, um, <clears throat> clear my throat first, but uh, <laughs> so I had like my first seizure at the age of three years old. Um, and it was during like Thanksgiving. Um, and I basically, uh, didn't get diagnosed of grid 2A until I was 13 years old. Um, but I am seven years seizure, seizure free uh, on uh, CBD and CBD only. Uh, now, uh, it's, it's one of those um, medication that isn't like for everyone. I mean, it's hard to get even, I'm in Colorado, so it's easier, but um, the CBD has helped me with my memory. It helped me like speak normally, how to do uh, stuff, uh, you know, and create uh, things, be, be in this uh, like, I created a, a little thing. I have something here in my pocket. It's like so tiny. I have like two pockets. These pants are amazing. <laughs> All right. So this is a like a cool 3D printed dragon oh. that I made myself. Well, I didn't make myself. I found it on the website. It costs like three dollars to get the file and put it in, and um, this was six hours to do. You know, with all the creativity and understanding, uh, like how how this works. I mean, it takes a lot of time. Like I would be sitting there on my three D printer and start crying because it didn't print. <laughs> it would like, but it takes. It takes time to do something like this. This is the glow in the dark dragon, by the way. Uh, it glows green, but it's too bright to glow at the moment. Um, uh, you know, uh, Benjamin, I want to pick up on that theme a little bit because you know we we had some prepared questions, but I think you're you're kind of bringing up, and you've all sort of brought up. You know, we've talked we talk about the problems and we talk about the difficulties of having a grief disorder. Yeah. Um, and one of the questions we were going to ask everybody, and, and I still will, is you know what what's one of the hardest parts about it? But I feel like I I, I want to ask each of you to comment not just on the hardest part of a grief disorder, but some of the positive aspects that have come, you know, from 
knowing that you have this diagnosis? So maybe we'll go in the opposite order. Um, well, for, for me, uh, the hardest part was reading, writing. Um, at, for, for a long time was speaking. Like at the age of nine years old, I had a hard time speaking. And, uh, but over the times, over as I get older, I'm 21 right now, but um, it, like even through like my older medication I had was uh, Capra Pharmaceuticals did not help at all. So at the age of 13 years old, we uh, somewhere in December, we decided to use CBD uh but otherwise uh and yeah the the growth kept on going um you know the struggles were actually another struggle i had was listening to the song songs on the radio and following along with the lyrics but as i took um as i like took the medication I was singing in the car radio and my mom was like almost writing this down as like things are happening too. It's like, that's great. Another... It's great to hear. And I, I want to sort of emphasize it's, there's a lot that we've all been managing and, and handling, but also a lot of positive bright spots that you're highlighting, right. which I think is so important. Jordan, would you like to tell us a little bit about some of the harder parts, but also some of the, the bright spots? I don't think that there's really anything positive to having a disease that makes your life harder, but I do hope that people who are more severe than me and also me find a cure or some treatment in the future or near future that could help us. I think that's a wonderful and really honest answer, um, but I will also submit back to you that I think you're all showing us the bright spots by your willingness to get up on a stage and talk about all of these issues and also the, the hope that you still hold despite all of the struggles. So I, I thank you for that. I agree, you know, there's, it's hard to ever say that there's a bright spot to disorder so I think you're absolutely right but I think you all find bright spots in your lives and your families find bright spots and I, again I, I applaud you for that that's really it's, it's a lot it's a lot to be here and a lot to to be able to put things in that perspective so maybe we'll hear from you just on yeah. about hardest hardest parts but some bright spots so the hardest parts I think for him I don't know maybe he, uh, it's the uncertainty, like Milan has this thing for which sometimes he can do things very easily, like wh let it, whether it's self-care or whether it's schoolwork, he can do easily. And then the same thing in a few days, he just cannot. So it's just a cyclical up and down, up and down for us. It's, we don't know exactly what to expect. So sometimes I thought, okay, I taught him this, he knows. Okay, the next week, he just will not be able to even look at the question, he doesn't know. So that is something that is, uh, difficult for him also to make friends. It's very hard. He goes to a special needs classroom. There he has friends. He's very sociable. And it's very hard for him to meet other kids cannot discuss with him because he has his own things to discuss. And he doesn't have the socially appropriate language or you know the behavior to, to talk to kids who are neurotypical. So for him, it's very hard to make friends. And in general, the uncertainty is just very hard. I mean, he thankfully has, doesn't understand yet. So he's very happy. He's very happy. He's very loving. He's always excited about everything. Uh, happy kid. So that's the bright side. And we get to uh, enjoy him. Like he's a teenager, but still he'll always kiss us, hug us, always say I love you, which most I heard that neurotypical teens don't do. So we are enjoying that. But that's kind of the positive thing. And now that the cure, I'm mean, not cures, but in uh, these uh, researches are going on. So we are Again, like just like she said, we are just hoping that in the near future, there is something to cure our kids, all of our kids. So that you want to say something? No, he doesn't want to say. He's shy. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that uh, like for us, there is certainly you know, there is the uncertainty, and you know while certainly nobody can wishes to bring upon themselves and more challenges than they start with it really has showed us the other power 
resiliency community, you're reaching out to people and you know that uh, ultimately I think you're only as hopeless like as you feel, you know, we're projected and it, you know, as you t- it reaching out, you see that you're never really alone. Yeah, it may be a long, difficult road, but when you just see like, like with our daughter's case, she's now reaching and holding her bottle like almost on her own there, you know, sometimes, you know, there's moments where she'll get a little bit of an ornery streak you know, and decide, no, I'm not gonna cooperate. But when you see your daughter <laughs> holding your bottle when, you know, a, a year ago, you never thought she'd be able to like hold the toy on her own or play with it. You know, that's just truly, you know, worth its weight in gold and it just shows what's possible, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, through persistence and you know, we just, we, we, we keep forward and, you know, we know we take it one day at a time. And as far as myself and uh, NGRA too, that the biggest challenges you know, or the most difficult thing I would say is probably the, the unwritten language of social interaction, social cues being like the last one picked, the first one picked on, you know, so that, uh, you know, for the longest time, you know, everything I was diagnosed, for example, as uh, AS with ASD in the early nineties. And then, uh, so, you know, I learned to do a lot of things, well, to entertain myself as well, but still to this day, you know, learning kind of the unwritten rules of social communication, you know, where a lot of my peers may have learned a lot of those things years earlier. And so, you know, that can make things challenging at times, but, you know, again, you know, I could just like, yeah, I, I know that giving up just isn't really an option. You know, it's just, uh, I guess that's where having a, having a trait of stubbornness can be a good thing in a way. <laughs> yeah, great. On that note, Keith, can we do one more question? Um, I think persistence is sort of a, a theme in terms of you know, persistence and hope. And we, we were gonna talk about hope for the future, which is one of the things that we had talked about, but I. I Maybe I'll focus it a little bit more and ask you to just talk about what, what are your hopes for the immediate future? I mean, what are your hopes for this conference? Well, I'm hoping that as a result of this conference that we can link up with additional families who are facing as many of the same challenges that our daughter is that uh, as she's about two, almost, uh, she's almost two and a half there, you know, and uh, they're just really uh, making uh, so much progress and then we could see like talk to other families that we know of in her age group and find that what we've learned about her and what we can share you know, with other families who are facing similar struggles but also to see that she's able to crawl and smile. she can she can do kind of a modified crawl but to be able to uh, see her able to move on her own there and start to uh, sit more and just be able to have a more independence or be closer developmentally to you know her I guess more neurotypical peers in her age group, yeah. Because the longest time it was just we want to be able to we we want to be able to interact with our daughter and know that there's somebody in there and see that the affection reciprocated. You know, to be able to make eye contact and get a smile and know that there's somebody in there and that that person you know can reach back out. You know that you know if you you know that right itself you know was worth its weight in gold. You know the first time you know we saw us reach back and smile and just want to keep that going so we know that there will always be challenges but you know the if she can like learn to like to some extent to help like feed herself there and maybe have just like a minimal level of assistance there you know, then I think that's worth every effort there yeah that's very powerful I think to quote some of our colleagues in the rare disease space you know we talk about milestones but we also need to be mindful that some of the inch stones are really critically important. And so things may not necessarily be measured on a formal standardized measurement in a, in a clinic or in a research study, but some of the most beautiful things are the, the simple smiles, and the inch stones in that interaction. So I really thank you for, for illustrating that. And uh, we're all with you in that hope. Thanks. Milan and Nipsida, what are your hopes yeah. for either either the immediate future or the conference or both? So um, again, like we are interested in all the research that is being done to know about with, from the conference and also to meet up with uh, the other families we haven't met. I see them on Facebook, so I know who they are. Just to feel that we are still, we are not alone. That's very important. The support we get, it's important. And also the research, we, when we hear the scientists talk about it, it makes a lot of sense. 
and gives us a lot of hope and help gives us the power to push along because sometimes especially with him uh, in the beginning he was just he couldn't sit up he couldn't talk he couldn't move and since then constant it has been constant push they're constantly pushing you no know, he cannot go to no, we didn't find child care we didn't find proper fit in school and eventually like in the school we are always like no he cannot do this and we have to show no he can and to push like you said the ink stones small small things he does and just it gives us hope so we are hoping that uh, research and we find a full cure and also in the meantime we get along with families and know that there are others like just like us so that gives us more hope thank you so much yep. jordan i'm sorry my brain's just sort of like foggy right now do you think you could absolutely i'll definitely repeat the question it, the question was you know what what are your hopes and you could answer that about your general hopes or you could talk about what do you hope to to learn and what do you hope will happen from this conference i hope to learn that there's possibly like different treatments out there and like what could help me and the other kids out there like me and i'm hoping that um doctors will find something and that we all could have something at least and even if there's not a treatment or anything at least we get information that is useful so that there could be a near in the near future a treatment or a cure uh, well for for like the everything that i notice up here on this board uh is seems like things are going the right path or working on it and uh, noticing the DNAs or something. And, um, but you know, the one thing that for me, my future, I'm wanting to write a book about like the journey I have through this, but uh, you know, the, this book is, is like my life with like running with donkeys um coming here maybe and uh just but yeah that would be a little couple of things for my future or yeah great keith how are we doing on time yeah 40 minutes or, or, or yeah absolutely because we have uh it's been about half hour so far so this would be a great time if people are interested in asking questions uh if there's online questions if someone can pass those to us we can read them and we'll are you having great, great great any questions for the group and you all have done a fabulous job already discussing um and you should feel comfortable either answering the questions or saying you'd rather not answer but um maybe as questions come up we can ask for volunteers for, for some of the questions no questions from the room Ah, here's a question. Hi, I guess this would be for our two young adults on the end. Um, do you live at home? Do you live independently? Um, or do you live with mom or dad? And if so, what if, if you don't live alone? Is that one of your goals for the future? Uh, so uh, for for me, I'm living with my parents, but uh, in the future, I'm wanting to live independently. Someday get a car. Get a car. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nice. I live with my parents and in the future, I do wanna move out and have an assistant, assistant, assistant live with me so when i need help or when i need the help or moral support i can have it that's great i hope the parents are listening too it brings up a, it brings up an important really important topic that comes up because you know many of us here who are physicians are pediatric neurologists we're used to working with your pediatricians and at some point you kind of maybe outgrow the pediatric setting or you don't necessarily want to be coming 
to places where the waiting rooms are full of babies and maybe you want a grown up doctor and maybe you want to start having some of the visits on your own um, or parts of the visits on your own. So I think it's, it's a delicate balance. Um, it's important that you have your voice and that you know, everybody in the family is able to, to work as a team. Just another question from the audience. Thank you all. Oh, is that working? Thank you all so much for being here and sharing your stories and being so bold. Um, it's very encouraging to us in the room. As a parent, um, I was hoping that maybe you could speak to something that maybe your parents or people who have been supportive of you in your life, some encouragement for us parents in the room. What are some things that your parents have done or people who have supported you in your journey that could be encouraging for us parents in the room that we can translate to our kids? Well, if you may, you know, I'd like to speak to that. Uh, uh, is that I have been fortunate that uh, my, my mother, she's uh, retired now, but uh, her background was uh, edu special education, basically teaching folks how to uh, teach students with special needs. And uh, when I was in elementary school, you know, there were some, I did it in the days with the social awkwardness you know, and seeming like with attention and what appeared to be stimming behavior. And at one point, uh, the school had mentioned that I was in, had suggested that I might be better off in a special ed class. Well, mom, who was very eager to, you know, to do what she could to help people with special needs, she had some choice words for the school administration. <laughs> basically uh, said that, well, she would pr basically homeschool me before ever letting that happen. And like, no, uh, Matt needs to be in a regular classroom. You know, he can do the work at, academically. You know, he just maybe have some challenges that he faces. And she was quarterbacking for me like that throughout much of my elementary school career. And I am thankful for her for you know, that being in my uh, in my corner in that regard. You know, and so I think that helped me in many ways. And then try working with different doctors in her field or to figure out you know, what made me tick. Uh, so. I think while I realize that not all parents may have the background and resources, it's still, especially at this day with the age with the internet, social media, reaching out to groups to find those folks you know, who you don't just accept when you say, say your kid, oh, will never you know, be attain X, Y, and Z goals, or you know, your kid will always be limited. You know, just you you really have to be your own advocate and go out there and talk to people. Hence why we have Cure Grin. And just more generally, you know, if you feel that there's something off or you're not satisfied that there probably is a better answer than you're getting and you know like really advocate and you know, the best we can do is advocate for our kids you know and you know, don't give up on that you know you never know you never know what will happen you know and I'm grateful to her you know even though you know she can be a little overbearing at times but I guess as we get older you know parents can be that way at times you know I do respect for her efforts that she did put forth you know and on my behalf and you know that's i'd like to think in that spirit then you know my wife and i are doing you know the same you know for our daughter as well so anyone else like to comment on your family's role in in your lives and what they've what you've leaned on them for well i have a couple of like for for me it's mainly my phone Technology uh, nowadays is upgrading to advance to help. Uh, like uh, for some, for some of you, uh, it would be fidgets or or something to fidget with, you know. And those help, like with the with the calmness and, uh, and making them calm. But for me, I use I use my phone all the time to. Um, if I had a hard time reading a sentence, I'll just take out my phone and I'll, I'll scan it using my, it, it's, it, it's already in the phone, like it's scan, it's the word, and it, I, sometimes I had headphones in or sometimes I don't, otherwise I can be in a quiet room if they're doing testing or something, but if I had headphones and, um, and I wish I had this phone in high school because uh, for 
for a couple of like reasons I could listen to what it says read back or whatever and it also would read back to me in English if it was a Spanish word or or whatever I or I don't know in a different language but um technology is mainly like the best friend in in now or for like learning different things um so Benjamin, I, I think that's an important point and not what I expected you to say maybe, but I think maybe something for us all to sort of think about that there's family and family input that is just as important for everybody with greed disorders as it is for people without greed disorders, but also that if you are facing challenges, you, there's a lot that your family needs to do, can do particularly early on, um, but there may be ways that you could achieve some independence and not necessarily rely on other people uh, for everything, particularly mm -hmm. in this age of blossoming technology. So I think that that's great. I think um, I want to make sure we have time for one more question from the floor. Of course. Yeah. To organize this conference, thanks so much. Um, I, I was wondering uh, when you first presented with um, some symptoms to your clinicians, uh, probably they did not diagnose that as a green disorder in the first place. What motivated you or your clinician to go after the glutamate receptor gene to identify? Because I meet with a lot of clinicians and they say that we have no reason to study glutamate receptors when somebody is presenting with um, symptoms that um, may be associated with green disorders. So what was the reason? What is there any specific reason that motivated you or your clinician to study the glutamate receptor gene and any mutations associated with that? And I'm gonna guess before we have everybody answer that it wasn't a specific thought that, wow, I, I bet these individuals have a glutamate receptor gene or a GREE disorder. I, I'm guessing it was a more general approach that, hey, this might be something genetic, but. I'll let you each maybe just tell us so that's really an important question. How, how did you end up in this group? How did you end up with a diagnosis? Well, uh, for us, uh, if you don't mind, if it goes first, it, it was uh, since we, our daughter was exhibiting significant uh, delays reaching her, ear, well, inch stones and milestones, uh, we weren't sure what was going on. Her primary care doctor said everything looked good uh, medically and her calcium. Uh, uh, B12 levels were very high. Uh, she had a heart surgery, ASD and DSD repair you know, at seven weeks. But just to give a bit of a medical background for her daughter, but there was nothing uh, that otherwise indicated why she was so globally delayed. Um, I suspected perhaps it was genetic because myself having been diagnosed with ASD and that maybe there was a component. So we took our daughter it was, uh, in it was July 2021 to the uh, Kennedy Krieger Institute in uh, downtown Baltimore. And uh, we were working with uh, various therapists. And after a time, uh, we, uh, they performed what's called the whole exome sequence, a type of genetic analysis that some of you may be familiar with. And after several months, there was a, uh, there was a genetic uh, defect that identified a um, aberration that uh, led to a diagnosis of uh, GRIA2. And of course, my wife and I were both like, what in the world is this? And this was roughly February of 2022. And further in, so this was, this was good to have at least a partial answer or something we could put a name to and to provide greater treatments. And it just so happened that one of the leads on her team had I think one, maybe two of the patients who had presented with GRIA2 conditions. So she was already at least somewhat familiar with the GRIA conditions. So those pieces happened to fall into place. And through further discussions found that uh, in our daughter's case, the variant that she has, which is actually typically de novo, it's uh, C1155.2TCP, if I recall correctly. That that's the variant, the, the genetic variant she has. That while well, it, it, she actually inherited it from me, and as far as I know, I think we're like the only two people. You know, so far they found it. 
a case of inheriting that particular variant. And so, you know, that's why, you know, we kind of learned it. We've kind of gone further down the rabbit hole and especially like uh, um, at finding out more about what treatments are available. And, you know, at least now we have some answers to continue forward. So in your case, it was really your daughter that led to your- uh, Pretty much because I, I, because I had always knew, you know, it was different and I always chalked it up to, okay, it was AS, ASD or variation thereof. And I was satisfied with that to an extent, you know, that, that's something that's fairly well documented. There's treatment plans. And I figured there was some genetic basis, but now having something definitive to say, okay, there, this is a potential root cause, you know, what, why it happened, we're still not sure, but, you know, at least it gives us an idea of going forward and that maybe it can be, maybe not necessarily fixed, but the treatments can be, you know, rendered accordingly. And so, yes, she, it, I'd say it was a learning experience uh, both ways. We learned as much from her about what's possible as, you know, but, you know that's, that we teach her. You all mentioned in your bios, you know, having to wait some time for a diagnosis. So I wondered, you know, what, what were the, what were the things that you pushed for? How did you advocate for getting a genetic evaluation? So um, in the beginning, when he was uh, eight months old, we took him to the pediatrician for a regular checkup and he said, okay, sit him on the scale. And I said, he doesn't sit. And he's like, well, he should sit by now. So he was the first one who kind of gave us an idea that something might be wrong with him. So then he asked for early intervention. And then we started taking him to all sorts of neurologists. We were in New York at that time. And they did all sorts of tests. Everything came out normal. And we didn't know what was wrong. But my sister-in-law, she works in genetics. So she told me, why don't you have a, just do a exome sequencing. And that time, we didn't have the full sequencing available. But we did the exome sequencing. Because my sister-in-law said, there's no harm. You can at least know. And we didn't expect much. But then it came out, came back with uh, this disorder. And that's how we went that direction. Jordan and Benjamin, you were, when you were little, we didn't necessarily know about these genes. And I think all of you together are sort of illustrating um, kind of the answer to your question, which is that it's many, many different symptoms that are not necessarily specific. So developmental delay, maybe early seizures, maybe developmental issues, and then a family history. And these are all things that pediatrician, a child neurologist might think about, but the, the truth is that none of them are specifically related to greed disorders. They're related to that whole group of neurodevelopmental disorders, but the greed disorders are a big part of that. And so how do you go from this general sense of something must be going on here, right? Some, there must be some explanation to this, to then these specific gene diagnoses. It takes families partnering with physicians, geneticists, neurologists, pediatricians, genetic counselors, to try to push for a diagnosis. That's easier today than it was for all of you. Um, and it's partly easier today because of awareness that groups like this is, are raising. Um, it's also hopefully getting easier as, as we on the medical side take on the, the task of trying to, to take what we learn in these you know, very, very special types of meetings and sort of take it on the road to more general settings. So to our colleagues in pediatrics, our colleagues in neurology, sometimes our colleagues in internal medicine and adult neurology, because we'll have patients whose parents are also affected by one thing or another, whose doctors aren't thinking about genetics because that's, you know, they're worried and worrying about all the other things that they have to worry about. So it really does require partnership. You'll hear through the meeting about centers of excellence, which is great, but I think we also have to take what we learn in our centers and our academic centers. We're very lucky to have groups of people like, like you all, we are very lucky to have groups of people within our own centers, but we've got to sort of take the show on the road and make sure that anywhere, not just at the places where you've been and where you've been diagnosed, but anywhere around the world that people might have this awareness that, you know, these symptoms just can't be chalked up to we don't know. Uh, we may not know, but there's a difference between we tried to figure it out and we don't know versus we don't know and we throw our hands up. Uh, it's sort of a 2023, it's not good enough to just say, we don't know the cause of a neurodevelopmental disorder and then not look for a specific cause. Uh, very different from when many of you were little, um, but the, that's how fast things are changing. We've got some questions from um, through the app that I wanted to ask. So uh, this is a question for, for you, Jordan, which is where, um, where and how do you get the inspiration to paint? Um, there's really just no inspiration behind that. I just sort of kind of go like, oh, I feel like drawing or painting today. And I just sort of 
just do it whatever comes to mind it's not something I plan out it's not something that is like I've had a good day I'm gonna paint the sun it's <laughs> it's like a spark of creativity yeah. okay um the next question um what specific therapies or routines did you or your parents implement that helped you um so people so, so the person gave some examples music therapy water therapy speech therapy um i did do speech therapy a lot as a kid and growing up i don't do it anymore but i think speech therapy has definitely helped me in some way but most importantly i think it's important that parents help out as well which thankfully my parents were there for me and very much supportive and did everything they could to help me and they did a very good job question for Milan or Absida, which is um, Milan, what's your favorite video game? What's your favorite video game? See? <laughs> okay, let's see, I'll hold it. What's your favorite video game? <laughs> see, Mario? Super Mario. <laughs> Any Super Mario. <laughs> um, okay, and the next question, this is for, for anyone there. Um, do you have difficulty with self-harm or aggressive behavior? And if so, were you able to overcome that uh, to be able to sit in front of like, how, sorry, how were you able to overcome that to be able to sit in front of a group and have a discussion like you are today? Oh, okay. Yeah. So yes, I was aggressive and violent back then, but I overcame it because my mom had figured out that I was having seizures based on the experience that she had the similar seizures that I had when she was 19 years old from a shot test thing she got for some illness because she wanted to get a job. And she had to take this test to see if she had this illness or not. She ended up having a seizure similar to mine in the doctor's office and one uh, another one a week later. And that's how she figured out I had problems. And she weaned me off of um, that medicine. I can't think of it on top of my head, but I immediately no longer was aggressive. I was way more high functioning, way better without all those meds that I was popped on. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to answer that one or? Uh, well, for for me, it was uh, aggressive uh, at like a young age. Um, I would probably say like a couple of things I remember is probably being pinned down by my sisters. Something about uh, not wanting to go to school or not doing my homework, but otherwise, it's in that thought process of I of remembering those things was I had a consciousness in the back of my head saying, "What did I do?" Uh, because I, I just, I don't, didn't know why I was putting, being pinned down. Some of them felt like they were for no reason. But when you see videos and you're like, oh, I did that. <laughs> uh, it like, and so, <sighs> now, yeah, it just comes to realize that luckily I wasn't, I'm not taking those medications anymore. So thank God. Uh, thank, thank you. We still have uh, a, about 15 minutes before break. So um, I can bring a mic. Yeah, so um, 
question from Jordan's mom, um, which, which is, it would be great. So a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of people with GRI have seizures. They're nonverbal. Um, so the parents maybe don't know what they're going through. So anyone who, who has experienced seizures, can you tell us what it, what it feels like when you're going through one? Or... Yeah. <laughs> so it basically feels like when I have a seizure, my mind black, blacks out. So it's sort of like lights are on nobody's home. And whatever I am doing in that moment, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going on. And my seizures have to happen in clusters. So it's like one, two, three, seizure, one, two, three, seizure, one, two, three, seizure, so forth. And so basically, like, let's say if I was doing the dishes and I was having seizures, I wouldn't know basically what was going on or if like I was in the shower or something like and it kind of messes up my memory of where I am in that process so then all I have so then the only thing I can do is all over but it's like my mind blanks out and then the side effect I get from my seizures afterwards is basically tiredness moodiness irritation Basically, just wanting to go to my bedroom and black out on my bed and just be like, peace. <laughs> so you want to be left alone. Benjamin, if it's been a while for you, do you want to talk about what it used to be like? Do you remember them? Uh, I kind of, yeah, I kind of do. Um, for, for me, it was like, I get warnings. And that those warnings were like, I would eat or drink uh water and be like this is this metal i taste the metal it's like uh and so then i would go to bed and my mom would wake me up and i go what what happened he's like you had a seizure it's like what i had a seizure it's like because you wouldn't like it, it's basically like not and those nighttime ones are scary because you don't know if you're going to be on your back or on your on your pillow or something, and it could happen any any time. Uh, because those ones you can like be buried from your pillow and won't be able to breathe. Uh, those are, so I had night seizures would would be even but we figured out that it was rosemary so uh can't go to mcdonald's anymore i think well but also i don't want mcdonald's so that's the worst <laughs> place um it, yeah so it's don't really feel as much as what's going on like maybe a headache when you come out of it and slobber just a lot of slobbers like with and maybe you had one of those uh, sci uh science candies where it just kind of foams in your mouth and then it kind of foams down or you're pretending to be a zombie but I don't think so. <laughs> i'm struck by how vivid your descriptions are but also i'm really um <laughs> I just, I really appreciate your bringing this all out so people can hear what it feels like for you. It's the sort of thing that hopefully doctors will have asked you and so on and so forth, but I think it is helpful just to have everybody hear that. Um, it's also, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of myth and lore out there about seizures and you know, people may assume that you may not remember, but they should ask you, shouldn't they? Ada, you know, what does it feel like? What did it feel like? What do you remember? Um, in addition to asking parents, what did they observe? And I think you know, it's been um, as varied as your two descriptions are, there's that many more descriptions out there and, and physicians and researchers and people need to keep an open mind and, and ask the source. So we, we've had this unique opportunity to, to have you tell us from your perspectives. Are there any 
last words you want to leave the audience with in terms of uh or like either their questions from online i can't see the yeah there are a couple other questions oh, sorry, from online questions. so um one question about fine motor skills so this is i guess like especially around how you use your hands and whether so someone's asking did you struggle with that in the past um and how do you feel about doing small hand movements today any challenges it's not italian but it's for sure epilepsy i don't know I don't know, maybe that's, is that a thing for Italians, where they just kind of move their hands like this? <laughs> Did, does anybody struggle with difficulty with fine movements? I mean, you, we have a painter, we have people who make 3D printing, which is more of a computer thing, but is, is fine motor an issue for, for anybody? Yeah, over time, yeah, in that case, fine motor skills have gotten much better, you know, over many, many years. I, I do IT work, you know, so we, we do a lot of typing, and I would use it as a kid, I would I'd try to put together models and stuff. For me, it was more mm, like gross motor skills and uh, coordination, so things like ball sports, you know, were, you know, not, did, and they did not go over well, so, but fine motor, I I think I did pretty well with that. Milan has difficulty with uh, fine motor. He cannot write. Uh, I mean, if he holds a pencil, it's very big and the letters are not uh, spaced evenly and holds in a very odd way and very weak, the writing. So it's getting better, but it actually is fine motor coupled with the CBI that he has, for which it, he has no perception, uh, depth perception. So he cannot kind of understand where he's writing. And other than that, like uh, gripping things, it's not difficult anymore. Used to be when he was younger, but now it's not. Now it's still writing. It's very hard for him writing or uh, he's has also sensory needs. Like when he wants to, he wants to do something with his hands. Uh, so I guess that's a fine motor. Is technology helping with that? Um, yeah, it, it, it is. He actually start, started learning to type and uh, voice to text. Jordan. Another question. Keith, I think Jordan wanted to add something. Oh, about the go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry I also struggle with some motor skills. I have a really hard time tying my own shoes, opening cans with like those can openers. You have to put it on tight and then just whatever, how you do it. <laughs> I have trouble with those too. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of have a hard time like doing little things with my hands. I can like write and stuff like that, but things that are like, I have to like hold something down and then tighten it with like one hand or whatever. That kind of stuff is like really hard for me and tying my shoes is just a nightmare beyond all things. <laughs> so, yeah. It's like uh, everyone's found ways to yeah. adapt though around, you know, I think it, getting back to what Benjamin mentioned early on with technology, there's, there's ways that you can kind of not just find workarounds, but find ways to do what your goal is. So if, if the goal of writing is to complete an assignment that you've got to do for school, maybe that might, that might be a bit harder, but if your goal is to communicate something, if technology can help with typing rather than writing it, it's, it's really opening some doors and then the voice to text, um, you do have to proofread it, but the voice to text can certainly be, uh, be a, a Benefit. So I hope that'll be some more of the conversation too. How do we how do we bring technology in and and who can help with that? You know, it's not necessarily something your pediatricians or internists or neurologists would even know how to do. But there are people out there who specialize in adaptive communication and and technology for for really all levels along the the spectrum. So I, I think that's um, that's something worth highlighting. Um, one more question from online and then we probably have time for one more in the room if there's anybody I can bring a mic to you or you can go to the, the mic. Um, so the question from online, what form of communication has helped you the most or any any communication aids or, or anything like that? Uh, I think of the best communication um, for Like for sure, like like I said, my phone and stuff. Um, uh, 
kind of like, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure, just. Well, you shared with us earlier you know, how powerful the phone could be. So that's, yeah. that's certainly one thing you've already kind of shared. So you don't have to feel pressured to come up with something else. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, the the communication for art like is wow now that i've already said it it's taken away for what i should add uh Benjamin, I think that just the, what you mentioned earlier was really powerful, just about you know, using the phone and how it has brought some independence to you. So I, I think we should maybe let that be your, your advice. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else with yeah. other communication aids with, that are helpful? Well, Milan now is not talking, but yes. Milan, you cannot stop him <laughs> from talking. So <laughs> he is now not the Milan that it usually is. So he usually can talk. Sometimes uh, the talk, whatever he's saying might not be the most appropriate for his age but he has no problems talking. The thing is writing. So now the typing and the voice to text is helping him if, to overcome. And also the phone. He also can, he's very technological. So I'm like, mom, do this, this, this. I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't know. So he tells me yes. what to do. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I'll say I've been struck seeing some of the patients who come to my clinic where if you give them a chance, you know, they'll find a video that they like on the iPad oh, yeah. or they'll find pictures and tell you exactly what they want to do, which is usually leave the office. But, uh, but there's a- Well, he knows you know, how to unlock the thing, how to go and find whatever he wants and then close it before I come. It's all this thing he knows. <laughs> so tech, tech support 101 is going to be uh, in, the, in the hallway by later. <laughs> yes. So, I think we've got a question on the floor. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for sitting there and having so much of courage to talk to us. Really, really impressed by how you guys are sitting there and talking to all of us and answering all these questions. I just wanted to ask you that, have you ever felt that um, you're not able to express your thoughts uh, properly to the people? Uh, do, have you felt like I do understand or I have more knowledge than what I can actually communicate? And does it make you feel frustrated or do you use any other ways to express your thoughts? Um, I really just try to communicate verbally as much as I can. Um, because sometimes like, like, so for like when I'm in the shower, I have tachycardia and sometimes it's so bad that I can't even talk as I'm like trying to catch my breath and I'm like crying. I'm like, breathing heavily and so I try to communicate uh just verbally as much as possible and other types of communication I have is like I have a phone so like I text I call I, I do stuff like that I just want to comment on not being able to express yourself or alternate ways of expressing yourselves all right, well, with that, with that as a nice example, I again want to thank you, Matt, Milan, Ipsita, Jordan, and Benjamin for sharing so much of your personal lives, so much of your stories, your family stories, your very, very frank and candid remarks um, with us. I think we all have a lot to learn from each other. I also want to applaud Keith and all of the organizers for setting this up. Um, you know, most traditional conferences that doctors and scientists go to our lecture, 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 lecture. And there might be a brief moment of hearing a story or something, but this is why we're here, right? This is why the doctors have come. This is why the scientists are here because of your stories. So I, it is just a tremendous, tremendous honor for us to hear your stories. And I applaud you for having the courage to get up there. They're not trained professional speakers. These are real people with real disorders who were willing and, and able to come and, and share parts of their lives with us. So thank you so much.